Well, good day to all of you there at Gospel Light Baptist Church. It's so good to be able to bring this little teaching on the Lord's Supper to you guys. Pastor Eric's asked me to do some things just about how the Lord's Supper relates to the Last Supper and how we get this incredible ordinance that Jesus has given to us to remember him by. So hopefully as we go through this, this will be a blessing to you. We've come straight off the back of going to Israel and it's so, so fresh in the mind of several of you guys there who went to Israel with me. I'm wearing my Jewish prayer shawl with the little seat seats on the end of it to remind us about God and his commands and what he wants us to do to live that holy life for him. Sort of getting a bit authentic here, thinking through it, have my cup here ready to go. So gospel light, here we go. All the gospel writers record the event called the Last Supper, where Jesus would sit down with his disciples and have the Passover Seder. And it would be that night where it literally the Passover lamb came to the Passover. And Jesus brings out of the Passover two elements, the broken body and the blood shed, and speaks about that being him, and speaks about the bread and the wine being him. And as part of this whole ritual that they would go through at the Passover, that Jesus pulls out this and brings to us the Lord's Supper. And that's what I want to teach you about here in this session, the broken body and the shed blood. One of the key things about this is the word remember. Jesus used it during the Last Supper to remember his body, to remember his blood, remember what he had done for us. That goes back to the Exodus when Moses said to the children of Israel, you need to remember what God has done. This is what has taken place. I want you to remember this day. And like Moses, Jesus also says in the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul then brings that out and said, this is what we do in the Lord's Supper. We are remembering him. So a couple of things I want to point out to you about the Last Supper and how it relates to what we do. The first element I want to talk to you about is the cups, the cups. During the Lord's Supper, we have one cup that we drink of. But during the Passover, there were four cups. And they're not necessarily four individual cups. Some say they were, some say they weren't. But there would be four times they would drink from a cup. And every time they would drink, it would remember the four promises that God had given to them out of the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 speaks about this. It says, Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out, promise one, from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, promise two, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, promise three, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptian, promise four. So I like to call it this way. Promise one, God said, I will remove you. I will bring you out. Promise two is I will release you. I will set you free. Then promise three is I will redeem you. I will redeem you. I will save you. And then promise four is that I will receive you. I will take you unto me. This picture of acceptance in God. So in Judaism, they would take each of those four promises and drink the cup four times. So let's talk about cup number one. I will remove you. I will take you. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptian. Just think about this. As they would retell the story of the Exodus, they would say there's no more taskmasters, no more babies thrown into the Nile. And it was this cup of sanctification that God has set you apart. He's removed you from that place of bondage and he has set you apart for him. And I could imagine as Jesus would retell the story as the host that God had removed them from Egypt, they'd just say, yes, and they would drink that together and the host would bless it. Now he would say something like this. He would say, and I'll try it in Hebrew, Baruch ato Adonai Elohehi melech halahem bore pere hagafem, which simply means, blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine. It appears Luke records in Luke chapter 22, verse 17, that Jesus took the cup and gave thanks. That's referring to this first cup. Then before eating, they would have the second cup. It would, be, it would represent the promise of, I release you. I will set you free. I will rid you out of their bondage. 
Now you can imagine those Jews as they've come out of Egypt, maybe their mindset is still slavery. And God wants to remind you that I, you are no longer a slave. You are free. And aren't you glad we're no longer a slave to sin, but we are a child of God and the truth has made you free. That's an absolute truth. And I can imagine as they would think about being out of slavery and they're free from these things, again, they would say, yes, that's what we are. And they would drink that second cup of praise and praising God for what had happened. Then the meal would begin. And at this point in time, there were two elements in particular that Jesus focuses on, the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs, as we think about it. They would be part of the whole meal. And what it would be is the, the, the unleavened bread was the reason they had that is because he said it's going to be a rapid departure. It's a quick exit. Now, we also know that leaven is a picture of sin in the scriptures, and it's also going to be a picture of his body, the sinless body of Christ. But they would take that unleavened bread and they would eat that unleavened bread with bitter herbs to remind them of the bondage and the affliction that they would have. And this is the moment that they would have the betrayal. Now, I have my matzah uh, folder here, this, this holder that is here. And in that, there is some bread. I've just got some old bread here, some, uh, some lavish type of bread. And you can imagine as they would take that bread and they would break it up and then they would dip it into the bitter herbs. Jesus said, the one who I dip and give the sop to, that's who's going to betray me. And I can just picture Judas taking that bread with the bitter herbs on it and tasting bitterness. See, forgive, unforgiveness has bitterness. Resentment has bitterness. And as he tasted that bitter bread, he would have thought about the bitterness that he had. And the Bible says he left. Then after that, Jesus brings out what we now practice in the Lord's Supper. And he takes that bread and Jesus pulls out this piece of bread. Now I'm going to pull out the middle piece out of my matzah holder. And he would take that bread and he would give thanks for that bread. And then he would break it. And he would break that bread. And he'd give it unto them. And he would say, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And I wonder if they were a little bit confused. I'm sure they were. Because he's literally saying to them, this is me. This is my sacrifice. This is my offering. This is me. Do this in remembrance of me. They didn't realize right then that very shortly his body would be broken for them. And then after they had eaten, then they would take the third cup. Now, normally in the Lord's Supper, we would eat the bread around this time, and then we would take the cup. But the third cup was an unusual cup. It was the cup of the promise that I will redeem you. It would come out of this, the Lord's Supper. This is the cup that we drink in the Lord's Supper. It's actually cup number three, the cup of redemption, reminding us the promise of, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. And, and, and they must have had the thinking I've got the stain of the Egyptian life on me. And God says, but I will redeem you. I purchased you. I bought you. And that's the cup that the apostle Paul identifies in 1 Corinthians. He says, it's the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And the focus is on Jesus. It's on Jesus. Luke again records the statement where Jesus says, this is the cup of the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood, and listen to this, which is shed for you. The personal application of this. Now, in our Lord's Supper, this is where we would drink the cup together and think about the blood that redeemed us, this new covenant. And he would say to his disciples, drink ye all of it. Drink ye all of it. It's for you. It's for you. Now, another practice in the Jewish marriage proposal he would, the groom would take a cup and he would offer it to his bride. And in doing so, he's saying, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my love. Will you take this and be mine? And it's almost like Jesus is saying the same thing to his disciples. Be my bride. Be my love. Be the one who I'm going to give everything to and take and drink it. And as we drink the cup in the Lord's Supper, let's remember everything he's done for us, that we are part of his bride, that we are part of his body because he loved us and gave himself for us. And then comes cup number four. Cup number four is the promise, I will receive you. And that's where the passage from Exodus says, and I will take you to me for a people and I will be unto you your God. 
It's the cup of acceptance, the cup that we have God's protection. And this is what's interesting, because it's this cup that Jesus says in the book of Matthew, I won't drink this cup. I will drink it anew when I come into my kingdom, but tonight I'm not drinking this cup. And his disciples must have wondered, but Jesus, you just said you're going to be betrayed. You need the protection of God. You need to be part of this whole concept that God has accepted us. And Jesus says, come, let's go. And they sing a hymn and they head off to the Garden of Gethsemane. For Jesus, the Passover was just beginning. Because when they hit the Garden of Gethsemane, and some of you have been there and you've prayed in that garden under those old knotted up olive trees. The Garden of Gethsemane was an unusual place. It was a place where they would head to as they're going up to the Mount of Olives. It was Passover, so it was a full moon. And you can imagine Jesus coming out of the upper room, walking down through the city, walking past the, the glimmering lights of, of the candelabras, the giant candelabras on the gold of the temple, coming across that little Kidron Valley. The blood of the sacrifices of lambs would flow down into that brook Kidron. And here is the Passover lamb, the true one, ironically walking through the blood of the sacrificial lambs. As he heads up through the vineyards, gives his amazing discourse of John 15 about I am the vine, ye are the branches, and then gets to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Luke says they would often go, John calls it a garden, we find two parts in a Gethsemane. There is the garden where the trees are full of olives, and there is the Gat Shemin, the Gethsemane, the gut shemin was the gut, the press, the shemin, the oil. It was the thing that pressed the oil. And there'd be a pressing down and a crushing of those olives. So the oil would come out. The first part would go to the, to the temple as the virgin oil, the first oil. And then it would be pressed again. And then three times it would be pressed. Ironically, Jesus prays three times as he was squeezed under pressure in the gut shemin, in the Gethsemane where he sweat, as it were, Luke records, great drops of blood. And you say, what, what was happening there? The Bible tells us he began to be exceeding sorrowful. It was like a sudden terror came upon him as he realized this is what's happening because God has said there's a fifth cup that you must take. And this is the cup that Jeremiah calls the cup of God's fury, the fury that will be poured out upon the unbelievers, on those that turn against God, those that reject God. It's the judgment of God. It literally, as Zephaniah talks about it and, 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 and the psalmists talk about it, God's going to pour out his wrath upon the nations, pour out his judgment upon them, his indignation. And that's the cup that Jesus said, I'll take that cup. And the Father said, you must drink it. And Jesus went three times. And if you remember, when he went to that garden, you can imagine Jesus with absolute agony looking at that cup knowing in his mind that the cup he's about to drink. Now, there was no cup in his hand, but it was the cup of what was going to take place when he would take our sins and be crucified for us. He knew what that was. The judgment of God poured on him. And Jesus in that garden is saying, no, God, no, Father, no. And you can hear the Father say, I'm sorry, son. There's no protection for you tonight. You have to take this cup. And Jesus three times prayed, please let this cup pass. Let this cup pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And Jesus took that fifth cup for you, for me, for the world, for whoever would receive him, that they don't have to drink that cup of judgment and fury because he took it for us. He took it for us. And when I think about the cup, Jesus drank the cup that we deserve, the cup that we deserve. And now, because he drank it, the cup is empty. That's the love of God. That's the message of the Lord's Supper. He did this for you, so you do this in remembrance of him. <laughs> 